Hello, I'm Christina Davis, Director of the Program on U.S.-Japan Relations. It's wonderful to kick off the new semester with a seminar series and welcome you all in from the cold, a little snow to greet our guest. We are um, happy to welcome Saori Katata, Professor of International Relations, Director of the Center of International Studies at the University of Southern California. Much warmer weather, but <laughs> she's willing to come our way. Today, the seminar is Indo-Pacific, Japan's 21st Century Brand Strategy. And this is really an important topic for thinking about Japan's role in the world. Because the concept of Indo-Pacific, while we can't really say it's an original geopolitical area, but the title Indo-Pacific is authored by um, the Abe administration, which formally adopted the idea of the free open Indo-Pacific as Japan's diplomatic vision and strategy. The idea of Indo-Pacific is trying to bring together the India Ocean, Pacific Ocean into one concept of maritime space. And the free open Indo-Pacific has become a term uniting this geopolitical agenda that includes everything from trade, infrastructure, investment, climate policy, health, cybersecurity, all of the above, cooperation. <laughs> And it has caught on with the United States as well, so that now the United States have the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which is the latest, greatest American uh, economic initiative in the region, started in 2022. Also a broad agenda, including supply chain resilience, anti-corruption, clean energy, trade, and broad speaking cooperation. So what does it mean to say we want to talk Indo-Pacific cooperation? It really is in part the sense that the rules-based international order is at a crisis moment with rising uncertainty brought about by China's potential threat as a rising power, Russia's imminent threat as an invader of Ukraine, a sovereign nation, a new outbreak of conflict in the Middle East, all of which is creating a sense of uncertainty about whether the old rules-based order is going to handle the current crises. And we must admit that these fora are also in some ways in juxtaposition to new initiatives sponsored by emerging countries, especially China, the BRICS group, the Shanghai Collaboration Organization, and also that these informal organizations, whether BRICS or FOIP, are taking the initiative where maybe there's concern that the United Nations or the World Trade Organization, the old multilateral order, may not be up to the new challenges we face. So at this moment of thinking about international cooperation, what is the role of Japan facing a new global order? We are really lucky to have Saudi Katara who is coming here to explain these ideas. And she is really a leading scholar in looking at issues from international monetary policies to regional order, broadly looking at East Asia and international relations. She's already published four books and co-edited six books, along with many articles in leading journals. Her books have addressed topics from Banking on Stability, Japan in the International Financial Crisis, which won the Masayoshi Ohira Prize, a book published in 2001. She had a more recent book looking at Japan's new regional reality, Geoeconomic Strategy in the Asia Pacific, which was published by Columbia in 2020. Today, she's going to publish, publish talk about <laughs> two books that will soon be published. One is a project coming out from Oxford University Press on Japan's Grand Strategy, Power and Challenge of Liminal Power, a co-authored project with Kei Koga. And she'll also draw upon her research with Jessica Liao, which is under contract with Cambridge Press and is titled Great Power and Grand Infrastructure in the Indo-Pacific, Competition, Convergence, Limited Cooperation. Thank you so much for joining us. Happy to have you here today. Thank you. I think I had the same comment as I uh, uh, could uh, follow Christina's uh, introduction of me. It's downward from here. <laughs> so I hope you, you know she's very good at kind of 
actually a high expectation and I'm very honored. Uh, thank you again for the gracious introduction. So this is an honor to be here. Uh, thank you for Christina, Shin and Jennifer for inviting me and taking care, good care of me uh, coming to Boston. Uh, I think we, I came five, six years ago uh, when I was talking about, the, uh, about Japan's monetary policy and we really had a very uh, fun time. And I look forward to hearing from all of you about the project that I'm working on. Uh, even though it's under contract, it's still being written. So <laughs> it's not a uh, done deal yet. I have a lot of, uh, well, I and Kay, I will introduce him in a minute, has a lot of work to do. So I look forward to all your inputs. So today's talk, talk is about Indo-Pacific, but in some ways, you know, uh, Christina was talking about old and new. And I would like to contextualize this Indo-Pacific initiative in Japan's overall trajectory of going back into uh, going back in 150 years, back into the Meiji forward. And that's the project that we are working on in, in this grand strategy, uh, about the grand strategy. So as you, you know, this is, I don't know if you can see it clearly, but this kind of depicts Japan's uh, uh, past from 150 years ago in terms of its uh, economic growth. So it's a GDP growth on the top. Uh, the next one is the per capita, as well as the, the growth rate over the course of year. The kind of strong dotted line is Japan. And you can see that Japan has been going you know, upward, obviously along with others, but the speed of which Japan has grown are varied over time. So this is 150 years. If you look at the military spending, Japan's presence in the world in terms of proportion has changed quite a bit over time. Again, the, the dark line, dark kind of shadow shadow in the middle is Japan, where you know, Japan was very, very, you no, know, had very, very limited military presence in the world, you know, back in the you know, early 1900s, obviously, uh, afterwards from 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, obviously, you know, kind of very significant increase while all of a sudden you know shrink obviously for obvious reasons in 1945 from forward we had uh what we call and i will get there in a minute the yoshida doctrine without uh, emphasizing the japan's military presence in the world but other things like you know, especially the economic presence uh, has uh, expanded quite significantly over time but as you see starting the 1990s there has been somewhat of a shift of uh, japan being now taking a bit more weight in the military presence in the world. So this is the overall kind of a big long scope picture that we are trying to cover in our uh, book. So the emphasis that we would like to give to our book on Japan's grand strategy is two major characteristics of Japan. So one is that Japan is a liminal power. Liminal power meaning some power that kind of straddle in between many things. And obviously, Japan always talked about the fact that Japan is between the East and the West. You know, the first Asian country to modernize, you know, one that beat Russia in 1905, uh, you know, the Western, Western uh, power, uh, as well as the kind of those who uh, disguise itself maybe as a Western power in the context of Asia. So usually Japan and Asia is what people talk about. Japan in Asia is another aspect of Japan between, again, uh, the West and East. At the same time, Japan's uh, power status changed quite dramatically over time. You know, obviously, at the time of Meiji Restoration in 1868, Japan was uh, struggling to survive. You know, other countries were colonized. You know, China was beaten by British and all these uh, uh, threat that was coming in place. And that was where Japan started in its modern history. While uh, in the 1930s, 1940s, uh, Japan was a major power in the region, you know, kind of Asianism, all that was promoted by Japan, defeated uh, very you know, con unconditionally uh, surrendering to the Allied powers in 1945. After that, though, 1980s, Japan was, again, Japan as number one uh, type of status in a very different guise. Uh, so this is the kind of liminal position that Japan possessed throughout this 150 year history that we would like to look at. The other characteristic of Japan is that Japan has had, again, in these 150 years, uh, utilized military or security uh, instrument and commercial means kind of interchangeably or combined in you know, various other ways. And depending on where Japan stood or had, had 
understood over the course of this 150 years, the way that they combine and they utilize these uh, foreign policy instruments varies. So these are two main characteristics that we would like to uh, sort of focus on. And here I would like to talk about this book mainly uh, with the focus on the, uh, the part that I'm working on. So I'm, I'm more of a uh, political economy person. So on the geoeconomics of what's going on. So what I would like to start with is talk a little bit about the concept and the theory of this book overall, the big, big argument, uh, overarching argument, and then talk a, a few minutes on the history because we are very proud of what we are doing on this history part. But then uh, again, focusing on the Indo-Pacific uh, in terms of the concrete things that I would like to talk about in terms of our analysis, how that kind of, uh, kind of carry into the Indo-Pacific, which we call it Japan's 21st century uh, grand strategy. And then uh, end with uh, implications and maybe a you know, contribution that we are hoping to give with this paper, I mean, sorry, with this book. So my co-author, you, you guys, some of you might know, uh, Professor Kei Koga, is an associate professor. He got tenure a year ago of the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. He has a PhD from uh, Tufts University uh, here nearby, uh, a few, uh, I guess, 10 years ago or so. Um, so uh, he is more of a security expert, and I'm more the IT expert. And I think this is a great combination to have so that we can cover both sides and really emphasize this kind of synergy or the interchangeability dynamics uh, between, uh, between economic instruments and security instruments. By the way, as I've said, this is an ongoing project. So I look forward to getting as much comments as possible, suggestions, and, and anything that, that we would take away uh, from this discussion. So uh, the theory-wise, uh, we define grand strategy as a state plan and, and practice to achieve its uh, national goals uh, by setting means and ways within the available resources. And actually, since this is a part of, a, a, I think it's called Oxford series on grand strategy, it's a series that's been commissioned by these three people, Valgas, Dobrovsky, and uh, Wright, and that's part of the over encompassing definition. So I have, we have kind of a mandate to, to stay with it, but I think it really works on our project. And uh, we would like to see Japan with its, with its agency. Quite a few people say, oh, Japan doesn't have grand strategy. It's reacting to the given external environment. Maybe that's true, but obviously Japan has its own uh, resources availability, uh, politics, you know, domestic politics and all that. Japan actually has its choice and, and kind of it has selected its uh, you know, kind of choices of grand strategies throughout the history in, in many cases. And that's where we are, we are focusing on as a Japan's, uh, Japan's agency. The other thing that, that, that our contribution is our framing through uh, institutional, uh, sorry, the historical institutionalism. And those who are studying it probably know how the institutions are pretty sticky, but there are some occasions where critical juncture emerge that shifts the, that kind of usual strategy. And that's what we are focusing on, the critical juncture and the, the time when past defenders got broken from one type of grand strategy to another. So that's, you know, that's what we are, are focusing on. And we look both the external shocks and internal conditions through which that, that's done. So our argument basically is the usual two by two. That is the kind of a way that uh, Japan moved forward in this 150 years and focuses obviously this uh, uh, middle uh, square, the critical juncture, where external shocks happen. And there are, so maybe the, the kind of the more the, the vertical, sorry, horizontal side, the decision makers will decide to uh, respond to external shocks. Some of them, sometimes it's a strategic change or changes in strategy. Other times they don't see that to be the case. We focus mostly on the time when strategic changes were called for and there are some leaders, there, there have been or there are, were and are some leaders which kind of kicked in this uh, need for change. Meanwhile, that's, not, that's, that's only the uh, necessary condition, sufficient condition being the kind of vertical side where the domestic conditions, the institutional setting has to be permissible to that critical juncture. So there's a lot of past dependence, uh, resist, uh, resistance from the domestic institutions. In that case, the past dependence will, will continue even at the time the leaders are trying to push for strategic change. 
So there has to be this uh, permissible condition that's especially in the domestic uh, context that uh, that takes place for these ground strategy to shift. So we we find uh, these four occasions of the sh uh, major shift, and obviously these are probably not at all a surprise to you. So that that kind of timing that we see a, a big shift in Japanese strategy. One is the Meiji era. We kind of cover about fifty years of Meiji restriction onward at the time until the time that. Uh, Japan wins the war against Russia in 19, uh, 1905. So that's the first major uh, critical juncture where shifting was clear and Japan responded to the external, uh, external shocks and uh, ground strategy totally shifted. Meanwhile, I think much shorter but very interesting time is the 1920s to 1930s. Uh, at the time of uh, World War I and between the World War I and well, into the next overall, uh, maybe you have heard of the history in the Sidehara diplomacy, which Japan kind of followed the international norm and tried to have more economic-based uh, strategy, but over the course of 1920s and 1930s, it shifted more regionist, more military, military-specific uh, kind of pan-Asian strategy. So that's the second uh, time that we uh, focus on. The third time, the post-World War II, the Cold War era, when the Yoshida doctrine emerged and kind of stuck as pretty long-term uh, kind of ground strategy of, uh, of Japan uh, with uh, economic emphasis and a very limited uh, commitment in the military realm. So that's the kind of history uh, part that we look at. Second part, which focus on the Indo-Pacific, so we have three chapters on this, is the post-Cold War era where Indo-Pacific strategy, ground strategy emerged and consolidated. It took a while. So it's not like it, you know, Gold War ended and Japan has the Pacific strategy, as those who are following the recent you know, Japanese uh, involved in the evolution of Japanese foreign policy know. 1990s, you know, it was very you know, unclear what was going on. You know, Koizumi actually did a little bit you know, uh, in terms of shaping it, but obviously Abe administration, especially from uh, the December of 90, uh, December 2012, uh, uh, consolidated this Indo-Pacific ground strategy. So, you know, this, I don't expect you to be able to read it, but this is the kind of uh, theme that we have for this book. Again, the three historical period and the Cold War, existing gold, uh, shocks, uh, core decision, domestic environment, and how it shifted over time. So this is, you know, kind of a, a one, you know, our uh, 300 page maybe book in one, <laughs> one table. So uh, let me focus on the Indo-Pacific strategy, which is uh, chapter five to seven. And there are two other, yeah, two other chapters. Are, so, so this one, I'm focusing on the rise of the focus on the regional integration and institution building. And this is really an important part of rule-based order. And Japan has really uh, taken a significant lead in this. So that's what I would like to focus on. And obviously for the free and open in the Pacific is a you know, crucial part of this altogether. But there's a kind of a surrounding um, kind of a, a evol you know, development so that I'd like to cover. The other two, uh, which you know, one actually Kay is working on, so I really can't talk much about it, is the maritime and the territorial uh, issues. That is very important. And then the third one that I can touch on if you're interested, is the public good provision in terms of infrastructure, uh, foreign aid, and, and uh, humanitarian assistance, and then things like that. So, um, you know, obviously, going back to Yoshida doctrine, uh, those who, who have covered Japanese foreign policy, I don't think I have to mention too much. This was, uh, there's a debate. I know some Japanese uh, scholars are pushing back that Yoshida doctrine was actually a grand strategy. I think it is, and many scholars think, you know, including some. Uh, uh, Richard Samuelson and various others think that it is. Uh, so it was a minimum defense and with a significant uh, effect, uh, significant emphasis on economic recovery and growth. And in many ways, I think it succeeded you know, beyond its, you know, Japan's imagination going back to 1950s when Japan was a desperately poor and you know, country with uh, you know, life expectancy of 49 years old to the time when Japan was economic number one by the late 1980s. Uh, but at the same time, there is uh, some kind of drawback in this strategy where uh, there was a significant uh, dependence on the U.S. security umbrella, alliance, and then so on. And, but you know, still, still there were some, even though there was some you know, gradual buildup in the self-defense or things like this. 
but you know, obviously external shock here is the end of the quarter. And for my chapter, which so so chapters have different external shocks highlighted, but my chapter there are several more kind of a, a multiple shocks that percolated into Japan's government needing to shift its grand strategy. So obviously the, the Gulf War number one in 1990 was the time of the major criticism Japan has exposed of its cheap riding on the security umbrella by the US, uh, things of that nature. Uh, the next one is actually for, for this regional integration was the 1997 Asian financial crisis. I've written a lot about it, so you might have uh, kind of seen this somewhere along your way, but this was a major shock for Japan. Not only that this miraculous economy, the region, not only Japan was a mirac you know, miracle, but all East Asia was a miracle according to the World Bank, the publication in 1993, but you know, all that was hit by this crisis and major criticism coming from the Washington consensus and the liberalist uh, camp saying this is a, you know, the, the crony capitalism and this is not, should not be going on. Uh, altogether, uh, that was a shock as well as the, the kind of then the rise of China and decline of other powers. And I think Krishna was already mentioning about the kind of uh, struggle on the multilateral institutions to provide uh, public goods. So some of these uh, really crucial parts that was the you know, provided external shock. In response, there are various things, and I'm not going to talk about this because I think I'm already <laughs> quite uh, uh, using quite a bit of time. But no, these are the kind of uh, actions, especially coming from the Koizumi era forward. Koizumi became a prime minister in 2000, uh, 2001. And from there forward, there has been a conscious effort of the Indo-Pacific strategy. They didn't name it as such, but ASEAN plus six, so, so ASEAN, 10 countries, Southeast Asia, three, Japan, China, South Korea, but then uh, inf uh, the insistence on Japan to add three more, including India, and Australia, and New Zealand, has been a major shift in the, you know, around early, 19, uh, early 2000s under Koizumi and moving forward. Uh, the first quad you know, came up after the earthquake and so on and so forth. The Prime Minister Abe, first time, first term, but obviously a consolidation of it, as I said was the Prime Minister Abe's second term starting December of 2012. Hoi actually later on got announced in uh, 2016 and from there forward. So altogether, this is the timeline that I'm looking at. The pillar, I, I think uh, Christina actually gave a good summary of it. I probably don't have to mention too much, but these are the kind of way in which the FOIP actually uh, uh, crystallizes the priorities of this yeah, grand, you know, Indo Pacific grand strategy, where rule of law is important, uh, the economic prosperity is also continues to be, and stability and, and prosperity and uh, peace and stability. And you know, behind it is the kind of now mixture of strategy of economic instruments and security instruments. So uh, you know, people call it other doctrine sometimes, like uh, Chris, uh, Chris Hughes and then so on, uh, or proactive pacifism is the other term. But the whole security uh, is, uh, kind of issues and economic issues being converged where security instruments can be used in order to enhance some of their economic presence, while economic instrument uh, very much so has uh, em embed a lot of uh, security component associated with it. You know, obviously in the back of their head is in competition with uh, China's rise. And one of the main thing that Japan has done uh, the regional rule building uh, through mega trade agreement. And I guess you have heard a lot about, this is a major coup that Japan has achieved. And this is totally in the context of the, the grand strategy is the uh, success con successful conclusion of CPTPP. Uh, you know, again, this is a repeat story and the Trump then left TPP and this and that. Japan was the one behind uh, slaving and concluding CP, uh, CPTPP, and now with the UK jo no, has already joined, and others uh, would like to join, including China, Taiwan, South Korea. And this will be the, the kind of strategy through which Japan is achieving this Indo-Pacific uh, grand strategy objective, as well as the RCEP, which was concluded and came into effect in January of 2022. So there are a few challenges associated with this. 
In many ways, the coalition building and membership is a crucial part of this Indo-Pacific strategy. And um, you know, kind of yes, RCEP would have been great if Indo India was part of it, but it left uh, the RCEP negotiation in 2019 and has not come back. Uh, Japan and other countries are working on it, and this is uh, you know kind of another area in which, in order to uh, maintain this grand strategy, coalition building is crucial. So. Taiwan is applied for CPTPP. Japan would really like to get Taiwan in, but obviously this you know, combination application of China, Taiwan is complicating this uh, accession issue. Uh, it's still moving, moving, but how quickly or if it's ever is questionable. Uh, you know, US, uh, UK just joined. And the ultimate, ultimate uh, goal or, or the, the dream on the part of Japan is for US to be you know, back in TPP so that, you know, this would be another way of establishing rule-based order with U.S. included in this process. And obviously, uh, I'll be happy to talk about it later on uh, because I give a few talks on, on this, but, you know, uh, IPEC, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, uh, three pillars out of four are agreed in, uh, as of November last year, but the trade pillar, which is crucial for many countries, uh, were not uh, not uh, agreed uh, by then, and now with the American you know, kind of election season uh, looming large, or looming large, or coming in place, uh, we are we as everyone is pretty uh, concerned that you know the future of this IPEC uh, on the part of the U.S. leadership, which relates to the Indo-Pacific, partly because and uh, is that you know uh, if you see the membership of all these mega initiatives, so CPTPP, RCEP, and IPEC, you know, US, the one that US is in is IPEC. And, you know, it's obviously India is there too, so it's very important for these things, you know, this thing, that the whole framework to come into being and being an active part of this rule-based order, but uh, at this point, domestic politics is such a way that we don't see this to be um, in, you know, our, our possible way forward, especially given the, how IPEC is set up. Uh, and we can talk about that if, if this is that I'm sure you know what's going on. Uh, so this is the, the kind of way in which Japan has achieved or, or implemented this uh, grand strategy for now. And in some ways, I mean, this is really uh, a coup, a coup for, uh, sorry. So, so the reason, so this is an analysis of the, the critical juncture, the reason that when it was possible was that these external shocks that I mentioned were in place and that kicked in the need for change. And obviously Koizumi started to take that on and then Abe uh, consolidated this uh, fully. So that's the kind of first horizontal part that I was talking about at the, the training uh, section, while the permissible conditions were there. And this permissible conditions were you know, kind of applied across uh, three areas that we are looking at, even though the manifestation of it differ. But when it comes to this area, the political leadership was possible due to the administrative reform of, that kicked in in 2001, where Kante and cabinet office, uh, the you know, prime minister's office and cabinet uh, secretariat becomes a key, key, um, key agent of these uh, foreign policy and uh, grand strategy decision making really made it much easier for Koizumi and you know, Father Abe to, to push this forward. And uh, obviously the second part, the long uh, ruling prime ministers are a beneficial because they can put these grand strategy in place uh, to, to carry this on and uh, circumvent and then kind of, yeah, I guess circumvent or, or maybe kind of go be overcome the sectionalism that many bureaucracy are having, this is a kind of past dependent from the past, uh, and create a grand strategy that is coherent in nature. And also uh, there are a few kind of voices, the veto players. In terms of trade, agricultural objection was really a big veto player, which Japan over you know, Japan, and especially uh, under Prime Minister Abe in 2012-13, when Japan became, came on board to TPP, was uh, successful in getting, uh, getting uh, overcoming. So altogether, this was the kind of story behind this uh, critical juncture that shifted uh, Japan's strategy from the kind of, you know, kind of 
tinkling around the margins in the 1990s to clearly have a coherent uh, basis of where to move forward. And uh, uh, it's been quite a success. I don't know this is the most updated one, but everybody's following Indo-Pacific strategy. Europe, uh, Canada, ASEAN, uh, even, even South Korea have this uh, Indo-Pacific framework. And this really resonated and you know, it was kind of, it was a nice um, a synergy with the, the global need and Japan's initiative. And it's been quite successful uh, for the last uh, five, five years or so. Now, the last slide in terms of the con that last uh, topic of the slide is where is it heading? And as you know, uh, Prime Minister Kishida uh, announced its uh, new point strategy in uh, March 2023 when he was visiting India. And that's the kind of general uh, summary that you can get from any website about this. Uh, there's a commitment on the part of Japan, about $75 billion in infrastructure support and you know, various things associated with that uh, for foreign aid, which can be uh, you know, kind of uh, offered from Japan instead of with the space. You know, many, many of those things are trying to put Kishida's uh, signature on this you know, point strategy, which was you know, kind of Abe saying, but move forward. Meanwhile, uh, it's been kind of uh, Kay, uh, Kay Koga, my co-author and I talk about this a bit worried in the sense that grand strategy nature of the Indo-Pacific strategy is now becoming much more of a, you know, kind of small things being accumulated from the, you know, the, the ministries and then kind of put it under the umbrella instead of big idea guiding these small things. And that is a subtle change and uh, maybe it's a different leadership style that is you know, between Abe and Kishida or different infra institutional setting that Kishida is much more listening to Abe's type of uh, uh, process where uh, Abe had you know, uh, kind of brains behind him and uh, all that. So now it's, it's changing its flavor a little bit, even though this, is con this will continue to be a very important part of Japan's grand strategy moving <laughs> forward. So just to conclude, so definitely this Indo-Pacific Grand Strategy is a departure from the Yoshida Doctrine, really different uh, take on how Japan should flag itself and leadership in the world. Uh, many of these external shocks that happened over the course of 1990s and 2000 really kicked in uh, the external shocks that actually shifted the ground and permissible conditions actually allowed this to kind of consolidate into a grand strategy. Uh, it's, a, it's a very important for institution and coalition building for Japan in, in this area, and then others that, that I know uh, will be there. Meanwhile, so I would like to just uh, talk a bit on the contribution of this project. I didn't talk much about the historical section, but the second and third chapter, so that's the history of Meiji and the history of kind of Taisho and Kishowa are the historical, main historical sections. You know, Yoshida Doctrine is kind of history, but, you know, but more so. And we are so impressed by uh, the several dozens of Japanese books, the, the books we read about this period in Japanese. And somewhat frustrated that nobody has cited these wonderful books. So to me, our contribution in some ways is really bridging that gap of you know, publication of a lot of interesting stuff in Japanese. And you know, even though it's a secondary source, but use it in, um, in our book. So that's first two chapters, the first two historical chapters. We feel like that's our one of our contributions. Really very, uh, very happy and very thrilled and proud to do, be able to do that. Uh, also, obviously highlighting Japan's grand strategy. You know, again, as I said, many people think that Japan doesn't have one, but I think there are, you know, they're, they're having uh, uh, many and it shifted over time. And you know, so really a uh, very important part that we contribute. And also looking at the external shocks, the interaction of international and domestic is a critical component. I always, that's kind of my thing that I always do. And this is, I think it's uh, also, I think it really gives us some flavor of what's going on that is uh, kind of interesting. Uh, finally, just the, the plug. So that's the, the black one is the one that I uh, produced in 19, it was 2020. So it's still, I think in the market. <laughs> Japanese version came out two years later. So if you're interested in reading in Japanese, it's called the uh, Nihon no Chikegaku Senryaku. So in the Nikkei from Nikkei uh, publication. 
Uh, the other one, actually, Kay and I wrote our first piece together in Ikean Berry's piece called uh, Debating Worlds. Uh, this talks about a little bit, let me just rub it. I talk about Japan's changing of global narrative. And I think I thought it was very interesting. Where, so it's, it's linked kindly to uh, the website that, that is uh, announcing this, uh, this uh, talk, is that Japan, when it was a weak power, so again, it's a liminal power, when it's a weak power, would be the global player and uh, follow the global standard and very, you know, very keen becoming uh, a player in a global standard, in a global uh, norm. Meanwhile, when it becomes really strong, it tends to emphasize its unique, you know, unique nature. So in some ways, you know, like 1980s, 90s, you know, those who remember that era, you know, Japan was talking about how unique Japan's uh, uh, business practice is, how unique Japan's society is, you know, even how unique Japan's snow is and things like that. So, you know, <laughs> all that is just kind of the tendency which inhibit Japan from being the lead, you know, global leader because once they're at the top, when there's a capacity, the narrative becomes like, well, we are the only one who can do it. While, you know, when they're not, which is kind of case now, it says, okay, rule-based order, global, you know, norms and all that. So I thought that was a kind of interesting and just wanted to plug that. Thank you. so much that was a fantastic um I, i'm really glad we could get the preview on the book and can't wait, wait to read the final product we have um, to get, get it written <laughs> <laughs> and also i neglected to mention this the event is co-sponsored by the harvard university asia center which is fitting given the scope is to look at how japan is taking a leadership role in asia and it is also an event sponsored as part of a special series on policy innovations with funding from the Japan Foundation, which I understand you're part of the leadership advising the Japan Foundation, and we're pleased to have Japan Foundation um, representatives here today. I would like to open up now to questions. I'm sure there are many um, perspectives, and I would first like to start off with Sayumi Miyana, who has just uh, finished her PhD at Princeton University and is here this year as a postdoctoral fellow in the program while she's doing research on Political Economy of Information and International Organizations. Um, thank you so much, Professor Kagawa, for joining me with us here and helping me with this project. Um, I want to open up the question uh, by following up on the in internal factors um, of this. So I think one of the common challenges for a regional or global power when they want to public, uh, provide public goods and uh, establish or sustain uh, the order is how to persuade the domestic constituents or how to design it so as to align with the domestic preferences. Um, I think in your other writings, you mentioned that the Japanese big business interests currently align just against you know, um, this free and open in, in the Pacific framework, but as it um, gets into more concrete uh, concepts and also as other countries in the region also um, has their own demand laws that Japanese largely power decline, um, what do you think? the tensions that may arise between the uh, domestic constituents and the government uh, brand strategies and how if the tension arises what are the government strategies to address these tensions should i take yes. one one by one is that i think we'll start off one by one and okay. near the yeah. end of time i'll start collecting uh, okay okay well thank you and nice to nice to see you again and uh really glad to that you can be here and uh thank you for the question yeah, so generally with the big businesses, especially the manufacturing businesses, this is what they also would like. Rule-based order, not only trade areas, but behind the border <laughs> kind of issues of their investment being protected and you know, no economic, economic coercion, this code word for what China, you know, China does uh, uh, is not utilized and things like that. So that's you know, obviously on one side. Meanwhile, there are several things that government actually would like to do that the uh, uh, private sector would be hesitant, like, you know, part of the economic security issues, right? So uh, Japan, uh, I, I keep saying, the Japanese government is very good, very good, or, or they, are, they, they, are, they tend to provide a lot of carrots, so subsidies if they show X, or, you know, things like that is really a good 
way to manage that. Well, if there are uh, the, the sticks that gets provide no that gets in place, then private sector will be <laughs> very hesitant, no, very opposed to it. So uh Kedan then you know kind of comment things like that would say, well, yes, fine, we can be incentivized to do certain things, but we don't like to see penalty coming with it. So I think now the I think what is the second uh, the critical infrastructure issue of the uh, economic uh, economic security promotion law is just being debated where some of the companies are worried about the type of requirement that government imposes. So that's probably one one possible um, tension. You know, I didn't talk much about economic security, but that's again the overlap of security and economic issues, which is the characteristic of Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, the other thing that is um, I see I see quite a bit is that Japanese government's limitation is the its resources. You know, its fiscal position is very dire, and uh, you know how much of this committed funds that it, like, you know, they say seventy five billion dollars in infrastructure, but it's not. They're not talking about budgets, right? It's mostly how they can actually uh, incentivize private sector to take on. All these infrastructure investment, and you know, yes, for you know, to, be, to, to the credit of the Japanese economy, there is still significant possible funding out there in Japan that could be deployed for that. So that I wrote about this in other places. We call it de-risking, not the de-risking that the EU people are talking about, the de-risking of these investments on the part of the Japanese government to make sure that. The risks that is associated with these humongous infrastructure investment would be covered in various ways by guarantees and you know by in the post Japanese government and then, then post government and so on and so forth that they can actually channel the private resources to that. And so far, it's slow going. You know, JBEC changed its own you know own requirement and things like that. They are trying to promote that. So that's the probably not necessarily tension, but the challenge of how much of this implementation Japan can actually, Japanese government can actually um, you know, put in place. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, Jerry, and introduce yourself. Um, I'm Dr. Kazakhnex Jerry from the DOPSG Student Center. I study Japanese economy and focus on how national governments interact with global countries. So a puzzle in my research that I've been thinking for a while is that Japan has the lowest share of inward FDI stock to GDP among the OECD countries. Um, so it seems that Japan has been um, has adopted a very cautious approach to welcoming foreign investment into Japan. And you can also see that Japan has much, much fewer, uh, many fewer bilateral investment treaties compared to South Korea. Um, so, um, so, so I know that um, Prime Minister Kishida has been promoting foreign asset invest, investment into Japan, uh, welcoming foreign asset management companies by setting up special economic zones. Um, but I'm not sure whether Japan will be more uh, ready to in, embrace foreign direct investment into Japan. Um, I think there are various barriers, including corporate governance culture and also uh, labor laws. So um, we've been talking about how Japan promote its own imports of its capital and trade um, into the uh, Indo-Pacific area. And I wonder whether Japan will be uh, more welcoming to foreign investment. Yeah, wow. Yeah, great question. And this is one of the main key issues moving forward, right? I think partly because you know, China investment into China is now precarious and not only others investing in China, but Chinese businesses themselves kind of looking to see where is going, you know, the Chinese uh, economy is going to head and is Japan going to be a possible, you know, kind of a, a Hedging or the you know the backup or whatever the you know kind of a, a, a you know kind of the facility wait 
the world economy waits and see how things are going to lead. So that's crucially important. Japan has been trying to have more foreign direct investment for a long time. I think Koizumi was the one who was like really gung-ho about it and it hasn't really expanded. And there is a lot of, you know, even though they say they want this to happen, and now with, you know, it used to be not as crucial because, you know, Japanese businesses had a significant, uh, you know, kind of a internal reserve and all that kind of stuff. But I think soon it's becoming crucial for Japan to attract for direct investment. And, and, and I think we are already there. That's one side. And then two, you know, two on, on related to China too. Um, second related to China too. But what's going on now seems to also counter to that type of need and incentive where economic security you know, uh, issues now catching, catching on more in the concern on the government side where now the permission for investment you know, without uh, without the, so there's a the exempt level of foreign investment up to ten percent uh, of you know, of reporting, you know without you no know, uh, without reporting. Now it got reduced to one percent of foreign investment. You know foreign investment within the Japan's uh, you know asset and things like that. So the economic security is issue is actually putting a stop to that, especially on the high tech side, especially from certain countries and stuff like that. So, so there's a lot of uh, uh, forces which are pulling both, you know, wanting some to come, but pushing others to not to come. And, you know, at the end of the day, I don't know where it's going to head, but like, you know, the, but there are some effort, you know, sorry, I'm not, I'm not uh, kind of being clear on this, but, but it's a very mixed picture of all, overall. And, but at the same time, there are efforts being paid about, you know, like the TST, SMC coming to, to Kumamoto, you know, various of these high tech collaborations. So it might kind of follow the American model of, you know, alliance shoring, um, you know, friend shoring type of where certain partners are welcome and Japan might, you know, Japanese government might make it much easier to invest in, you know, for them versus some not so much. While the funding, you know, related to China is the major part and where that, that's going to be in overall context is I, you know, I think it's now happening as we, as we want. I think it's a really important question. And, you know, I think it's, it's, it's happening at this point. I, I really can't have the conclusive analysis on that yet. Okay. Uh, Dr. Sensei, and thank you for coming here on the, from the uh, uh, the other way, uh, opposite uh, the side of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it is very long, but anyway. Uh, my question actually, I mean, about the, about the uh, CPTPP because I mean we have worked together. I mean CPTPP project you know, uh -huh. before. Right. So as far as I know, you know, government of Japan seems like very reluctant to set about the negotiation for the CPTPP enlargement, and mainly because of the China is on the top of the waiting list, right? But you mentioned. Like I mean, uh, rule of law is one of the uh, the uh, important element of the uh, four grand strategy, and uh, so CPTPP could potentially uh, expand solid rule of law in international trade, not only to the Asia but also the South Africa, including the uh, the Uruguay and uh, uh, Costa Rica, mm -hmm. which are now you know, I mean applying for that. Uh, what it is, I mean, it potentially I mean could uh, the increase the channels. And also, I mean, we are expansion of the CPTPP could contribute to the formation of the uh, so-called friend showing much more useful than the IPEC activity. So in this context, you know, uh, the point grant strategy is that what should be the, uh, Japan's uh, strategy for the uh, CPTPP expansion? I would like to hear from you what you think we the strategy of the CPTPP expansion. I know, I know your answer because, I mean, we discussed that I mean, before. <laughs> Well, my you know, I mean, answer is very simple. I mean, uh, just go for it, you know? Right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, so yes, in some ways, you know, China's accession is the big one. I know in Japan, right. there are a lot of pushback. Right. Meanwhile, saying no to it is very da no, dangerous or, or undermining Japan's credibility in many ways in the eyes of the Asian partners, like, you know, Singapore and various countries are totally for it. 
And I think in some ways, if you want to do what you preach, this is kind of thing that Japan needs to do. So whether or not, so again, domestically permissible condition, allow that to really move forward or not is probably the key from my perspective of political science person, because uh, you know, Japanese domestic politics is a mess right now. And I don't know, Kishida has that gravitas that could uh, actually push this forward is probably somewhat, at this point, you know, questionable. But overall, if you say Japan, no, should Japan allow that to happen? I think yes, it should, especially now that China's economy is has weakened in various ways. And it's important for their reformers in China, within China, right. who is the one behind pushing the China succession to CPP, could have instrument leverage to actually push this reform within China forward. So in many ways, I do think Japan should support it. While would Japan be able to? That's a hard question, especially, you know, I guess it's kind of connected to when, okay? I think kind of buying time is not kicking kind of down the road is what's going on, not only by Japan, but various others. So that's where we are, but. I also have a question online that ties into this because it's not just Japan's decision. Yeah, everybody has also to say, the yeah. consensus that's necessary. Yeah. And so um, I uh, see the question about Australia and some of the other countries have been making it conditional on China ending its economic coercion. Yeah. What types of conditions should be laid out for China to be a serious candidate? in the CPTPP? Well, so abide by not only abide, no, so not only promise to abide by all the rules that are agreed upon in CPT. So China has to actually swallow everything. Right? They, the new accent, newcomer to the CPT cannot change right. the rules. So not only do they have, no, so because China has to fully abide by it, but also make certain procedures that would allow violation to be to be either penalized or, or clear or you know be, be you know be be addressed right would be the most important part i think you know us had this wto china in wto 20 years and japan has been relatively how do you call it friendly to this assessment how china really follow the rules or not Mm. Well, U.S. has been very, very critical. So that cannot happen for TPP, CPTPP. So that's you know, that's definitely one part of it. Mm -hmm. The other part of it is, I guess, you know, Carlos Car can tell me more about, about the, the legal procedure, but it will be nice for others to join CPTPP before China can, so that weight is larger. So, you know, UK was great. It really kind of, kind of strengthened the hands on the part of those who are okay. looking. And actually, the question online suggests, well, would the US joining is necessary. <laughs> necessary, but impossible. It's, it's up to US, right? <laughs> but um, yeah, but but I think having coalition that can, within CPTPP, that can actually, you know, kind of hold Chinese hands and say, okay, you can't do this and, and have ways to you know, penalize it. Violations are made, you know, and, and all the countries feeling, all the government feeling, that's in place would be a really, really good condition to allow China in. And I think in 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 some ways, you know, with the U.S. distancing, you know, more and more from free trade and liberal order, and all of that, you know, kind of having China included, actually. Is you know really double edged sword. So you know, really need others coalition very strongly to be in place to stop mm. that. But if we we as the collective members of CPTPP can do it, I think it's a good coup actually. Mm. So you know CPTPP rules and the causes they can tell us uh, too much more. But well, actually made China in mind. It would be great if China can join somewhere along the way so that, you know, 
uh, the state-owned enterprises will not you know, violate these rules. So you know, all, all those conditions with China in mind. So having it actually come in, come and join, dream come true in some ways in a very ironic way. If it can be held up to comply. Right, exactly. Which is the challenge. Yeah, the, the maybe, yeah. <laughs> we can take another two questions in the room and I want to get to our last online question. So hold up your hands. I keep looking to the right. Did I miss anyone on the left? No? Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dr. Shida, the uh, West Associate from uh, USA Pandora. I have a question about the concept of critical juncture in your presentation. Uh, I can understand the Yoshida doctrine was generated during the critical juncture. Yeah, 1950s were actually every institution began growing and changing. So it, it, it can be called a critical juncture. But uh, on what criteria you can say the Indo Pacific uh, strategy was generated and consolidated during critical juncture? Mm -hmm. You know, the China took over the regional economic giant position in early 2000. And uh, uh, military power was beating up for decades. So the, the, you, the, the economic and security environments are changing gradually, yeah. right after the Cold War. But the uh, Indo-Pacific strategy was actually consolidated and supported in under the administration in uh, 2010s. So, uh, on how can you apply the critical juncture to such a long period? That's a question. Yeah, well, very good question, and I think we are uh, we are working in this whole process. Definitely, it was not necessarily like one major critical juncture, but there are a few that kind of came into place that made the final consolidation possible as of you know, probably 20, 2012 forward with the Abe administration with the solid you know, institutional setting. So uh, many of the small changes, so the change was needed as of mid 1990s already but many of the institutional rigidity continued. And I think permissible condition that allowed critical juncture, allowed critical juncture to set in was 20, 2001. So that's the administrative change and the Koizumi coming and having a pretty clear um, institutional setting that could actually kick the critical juncture in. But you know, I, I, I agree that it took another 10 years almost, of more than 10 years, to have really consolidation of it. And among, during that time, you know, the prime ministers changed and Abe, Abe, Prime Minister Abe tried to do it in 2006 and seven, really didn't stick. You know, we kind of tried to see if there were any follow up after this arc of the freedom and prosperity thing and, and very little was followed up on it and came the DPJ. So all that was a kind of hiatus for a while. But the whole need for that was still in place, so that's why they could come back and you know take up and the the brains behind it, you know, Kanehara and you know uh, what's his name, uh, Yat Yatsan, all those people were still kind of having that ideas in their you know in their back pocket as they you know kind of came back up to be the leader you know, in the leadership position. So yes, you are you are right that it's it's not that clear 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 juncture that as you see in the fifties or you know kind of other times. But there were gradual shifts, and some institutions actually allowed that happen, came in. And you know, finally, you know, at the other time, the kind of control of sectionalism on the part of the bureaucracy was put in place in terms of uh, you know, the personnel uh, decisions and things like that. So that whole thing kicked in, consolidated as of 2021, I'm sorry, 2012. Yeah, but good question. Thank you. Thinking about what is Japan's role. We have a question from Joe Gerson online asking if Japan is still just basically supporting US domination over the South. Mm. And also in a separately thinking about the, you know, the resurgence of Japanese defense spending. And is that just within the umbrella of the US Japan Defense Alliance? Or is this more of an autonomous security role as a new public goods provider for Asia Pacific stability? Mm. So I wonder if you could think on that level, what is this new initiative from Japan? 
So right. role of Japan, both in terms of the global south and in terms of the kind of security as a public goods. Right. right. And all of that very shortly because we're almost <laughs> at the time. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so obviously, the Japan is still in support of this liberal order. Right? You know, not, they're not reinventing a new order. So that's mm -hmm. one. And hopefully U.S. can still be a major player in it, but not counting fully on it is probably where Japan is. So just in case the U.S. You know, kind of log off and not come back for at least for a while, then Japan can actually keep the torch, you know, keep the torch of the liberal order going. So that's definitely part of what Japan is trying to do. In terms of security, uh, uh, definitely it's a part of public goods too. I, I think obviously alliance is still important and that's not going to go away. And you know, now with Korea participating, this kind of becomes to be maybe a possible more multilateral setting rather than just a bilateral one. So mm -hmm. that's a kind of a movement that's you know that's ongoing. Meanwhile, um, other things like maritime security, you know, Japan is doing it with ASEAN without the U.S. in many cases. So I think in nowadays, you know, being able to do that without necessarily the U.S. either backing or forcing or pressuring uh, or whatever dictating. Is a new, really a new thing, and I think it's an important aspect of this grand strategy. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking our speaker. Oh.